Welcome back everyone to our video series looking at NSAIDs and the pharmacology of this class of drugs. Today we're going to be looking at one specific feature of this class and that is antipyresis. And as we discussed in our previous video, oh, I have not given myself enough space there, antipyresis. So as we discussed in our previous video, antipyresis refers to a reduction in fever-like symptoms. So let's dive right into it. We've got a lot to cover today. The regular body temperature on average is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Technically, a temperature greater than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit refers to fever. But from a clinical standpoint, and what you'll see in a lot of your textbooks, is that 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit is the clinically relevant definition of quote-unquote fever. Now, fever is a feature of innate or nonspecific immunity. And if you remember from your microbiology, this refers to some of the features that are nonspecific to the kind of invader that the body meets. So for example, if we have a viral or a bacterial infection, some of the nonspecific features or, or innate features are things like complement activation. But another thing, another feature is fever. And finally, Fever itself is defined as an increase in the thermal set point of the body. The way I want you to think about this is that imagine you have a thermometer. So I will attempt to draw a thermometer or a thermostat in a house. And actually that's a pretty poor drawing of a thermometer. So in that thermostat, the thermostat is the headquarters for the temperature control of the entire house. Now, if I go into a certain room and measure the temperature, it's possible that the temperature might not be reflective of the thermostat amount. What the thermostat does is, on average, it tries to maintain that temperature throughout the house. So in the same way, by increasing the thermal set point of the body, you don't necessarily change the uh, exact temperature of every part of the body to the final temperature of the fever, but the average temperature fluctuates around the fever temperature. So let's go into the mechanism on how fever actually manifests itself. So we begin first with a noxious stimulus. This could include infection, chemotherapeutics, trauma, inflammation, and by infection, Remember that if you have a bacterial infection, it's oftentimes the lipopolysaccharide coating that can directly cause this response. So some sort of noxious stimulus causes the release of a cytokine storm or, or a series of cytokine messengers. Some of these include interleukin-6, interleukin-1-beta, and TNF, tumor necrosis factor. If these three molecules sound like gibberish to you, a brief explanation of their function in this capacity is to act as immune system messengers and, and you can think of them as signaling molecules, immune messengers. So once these cytokines are released, they circulate in the body and they interact with vascular endothelium cells. And if we remember from our previous videos, this is one of the major sites of the cyclooxygenase enzyme that is being constitutively uh, produced. So when they interact with vascular endothelium and specifically the COX enzyme, uh, remember cyclooxygenase is responsible for the conversion of arachidonic acid to our prostenoids. And these prostenoids are, as, we'll, as we will see, responsible for the increase of thermal set point that is related to fever. So we get a production of uh, our, our prostenoids from an activation of COX-1 by these cytokines. Now what also happens is COX-2, remember that's the inducible form of the cyclooxygenase enzyme, is, well, it's induced and we get a massive amount of prostanoids, but most specifically, the one that we care about is prostaglandin E2. 
So what I want you to focus on here is that fever is largely an inducible uh, phenomenon. So it's induced by this large cytokine release. And by forming a lot of cyclooxygenase 2 enzymes, we get a massive amount, like we're talking 100 to 1,000 times the amount we'd get at the normal constitutive level of these prostanoids. And specifically, we're talking about prostaglandin E2. And when prostaglandin E2 is produced in the central nervous system, I'm going to explain this a little bit more. So when prostaglandin E2, let me move down here actually, is produced in the central nervous system. So for those of you who are a little bit more neurologically inclined, that's in the, at the site of the hypothalamus, which is, as I mentioned above, the thermostat of the house. This is the thermostat of the body, the hypothalamus. And specifically, uh, as I said, for those of you who are neurologically inclined, the pre-optic area of the anterior hypothalamus. This is the site of the, of the massive PGE2 uh, induction. And this causes an increase in firing of the neurons in the hypothalamus. So increase in firing, which increases the set point of the body. And the way that the set point, uh, the way that the temperature is increased is you get subcutaneous vasoconstriction, which if you think about it, the blood from the surface of the body, which is the easiest part to lose heat from, this blood is squeezed into the core of the body, so it goes to the core of the body, and that's where heat can really be retained. And uh, for those of you who have had fever uh, in the past, uh, there is obviously shivering, so muscle, muscle tremor, muscle flexion, or excuse me, not flexion, um, muscle tensing, uh, and that's why sometimes you, you get soreness affiliated with fever. So let's, let's just go over this quickly. So we had noxious stimulus. Sorry, this diagram is getting a little bit a little bit hectic. So noxious stimulus leads to cytokine release, which causes a release of, uh, from the vascular endothelium, we get a lot of prostaglandin release, but mainly we also get COX-2 activation. And COX-2 causes a massive release of prostaglandin E2, which when it circulates and makes its way to the brain or specifically in the brain, causes the hypothalamus to increase the firing of uh, neurons related to the set point of the body. This increase in firing causes an increase in the temperature of the body and we have our fever. So how can we stop this and how do we use drugs to stop this? Well, if you remember, our NSAIDs were inhibitors of the cyclooxygenase enzyme. So, by treating patients with drugs such as aspirin, ibuprofen, and, uh, for example, indomethacin, other NSAIDs, uh, things like, uh, why am I having a blank, acetaminophen, we can actually cause an inhibition of this COX-2 mechanism and this COX-1 mechanism to reduce the amount of PGE2 formed and therefore prevent any of the action at the site of the hypothalamus. So let me just clarify that. So by so NSAIDs decrease fever by inhibiting excuse me by inhibiting cyclooxygenase two, which is the main contributor to the prostaglandin E two. Um, because it's inducible in the, in, at times of fever, where you have things like infection or trauma. And by, by preventing this mechanism taking place, we prevent the increase, no increase in thermal set point.